Welcome to Cute Widgets and More. In today's episode, we'll look at a surprisingly simple thing named the class QTimer. It gave me a bit of headache recently, so stay tuned for the full story. I was in need of a clock. You know, a digital clock looking like the one up here. And I wanted this clock to be fancy, so it should be changing between blue and red and blue and red every second. Why would I want to do that? Well, because I need to demo QTimer and an issue I had with it for you. Of course, that was not my exact need. But as you can see the clock here, it continues staying blue. Why is it not switching between blue and red as I clearly in my code said that it should? Well, for that, we need to inspect the code. The code is a simple class called broken. Oh, there it's red now. So it changed red. It, it did, it, you, you saw it, right? It's a class called broken clock. Clock. It's a Q label. So what you see here is just a regular Q label. The broken clock sets up a font here. It connects a timer to the timeout. It calls this update time, which is uh, the method that we call whenever we time out to. Uh, and the reason why I call it up front here right away is that otherwise, if I hadn't called it before the show event, then the label would show up in its uh, size hint, which is uh, rather small. And then I would need to resize it afterwards. So I called it beforehand. And also a small little thing that you'll notice when you go down and look in the update timer. I Here is, I'm calculating the time here. I set the text, that's the text you see all up here hour, minute, seconds. I changed the color of the window text to be either blue or red. And I do that by increasing this color variable here with an by one every time and then modulo tool, which will make a change between the two. I set the palette, palette to be this. And then I don't know why I had this fear that my timer could somehow drift. Um, if I wasn't careful enough. So therefore, I decided I will, every time I get in here, I will execute the, the set interval again. So I'll figure out how far into this second are we now subtract that from a 1000 millisecond, and then set that as a new interval so that I was very sure that I would hit on the clock every time. But it doesn't change the color. Well, it did once we saw that a minute ago. Why is that? I'll give you one second to think about it or one second to pause the video and look at the code because it is on the screen right here. You ready to continue? Okay, let's look a bit further in the code. The color here is an instance variable. So that should be cool. And the percent two, well, we've done that a billion times. So that should be too cool too. We are setting the palette. Everything's cool. So at some point, I at least came to the realization, let me look at that timeout. So let me type real fast. That was fast, wasn't it? Uh, QD block here, try to figure out exactly when does it come. And uh, while it's building, well, it was fast building, now it's blue again. We can see over here, and let's just stop it because we've seen what we need to see. The first one here came at 211 millisecond in, but that was just because that that was when I called my update uh, time here in the constructor. So that's cool. Now, down in the update time, I scheduled it for going on the the next second, on the zero millisecond of the next second, but it actually came two millisecond early. And then it came again, because then I triggered it again to go on that second, namely two milliseconds later, but this time it came two milliseconds too late and then two milliseconds too early and two and so on and so on. Ooh, down here we were four milliseconds late and now we're down to being one millisecond early. I'll bet you had it run long enough, it would have hit the zeros millisecond. That was truly puzzling to me when I did this. And of course, I didn't do it with the seconds, I did it with the minute, but I hit the two milliseconds before the minute mark which meant that my time wouldn't update. And then I would be sitting there for a whole minute with the wrong minute. You get the idea, right? So I looked a bit further and I came to realize that there is actually different timer types. It's now possible 
to specify using set timer type what kind of timer types you want. And the documentation for it, right up here now. What you can see here, there's actually three different timer types. There's the course, quas, I don't know how you pronounce that, timer, which will stay within 5% of the interval. There's a very coarse timer, which will only give me accuracy of a full second, which makes sense. I mean, uh, if I ask for a timer 20 minutes into the future, it does likely not matter much if it's 20, 20 minute and a second or 20 minute exactly. And then there's the precise timer. But let's go back to the course timer, which is the default. It will give me it within 5% of the desired interval on each side. So I can go wrong both before, as you saw, and after. And why do we have that in the first place? And why didn't I know about it? Well, first of all, it was added in 2012, I've, I found from reading the source code. And uh, I might not have looked at QTimer's documentation since then, because, well, it's one of those classes that I've used forever. That's the wrong reason for it. And, well, that's the reason why I didn't notice it. But why was it added? Well, that has to do with embedded devices and especially embedded mobile devices running on batteries. Because what they want, the very, very, what they do not want, rather, is to wake up from a timer every so often. Uh, because every time it wakes up, the mobile device will drain a bit of battery. So what Qt is trying to do here with this is to synchronize. So if you have a bunch of timers that goes off ever so often, then it tries to synchronize them so that it can be woken up less seldom. So in code, it looks like this. Simply say M timer, set timer type to be precise. Let's try that and see when it fires now. And you can see at least now it's blinking between red and blue again. And this is the one that was uh, that was the, the setup initially. There's one that is a rather a bit too late there. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that is. But after that, you can see that it comes within a millisecond or at most two. And um, most of the time it comes uh, within, well, two milliseconds, it seems. And it never comes too early anymore. So while we are on the topic of timers, I want to just demystify timers a bit. Over the years, when I've given Q trainings, I often had people with the expectation that a timer would somehow be able to interrupt whenever you were doing something. But no, timers are run by the event loop, just like any other thing in Qt. So if you have a mouse press on a button and that goes into a slot, and that slot takes 10 seconds to execute, well, in those 10 seconds, your application will not repaint. It will not act on other mouse presses. It will not act on timers. Let me show you some code that I prepared for exactly showing that off. So instead of acting on a Q push, push button, hmm, that's a fancy push button, a Q push button. Instead of <laughs> executing on a Q push button signal and going into a slow slot, I thought I'll do it with two timers. So the code goes like this. I have a timer goes off after 300 millisecond. And given that the code nowhere says timer set single shot, it will mean that it's a continuous timer going off 300 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, and so on. Okay. The timer, when it times out, it goes into the slot that just prints the minute and second and milliseconds, and it continues for 20 iterations and then it stops. Otherwise, it'll start scrolling away when I'm showing you this code. I start this timer. Then I create another timer that goes off only every two seconds. So instead of two thousand milliseconds, we can make it easier here on our, the eye and say two seconds. And whenever that one goes off, it will print out good night. Then it'll get to the, I know that this is running on the core or the, the, the event loop, the, the primary event loop and or the GUI event loop, I think it's called. On there, I'll go to that one thread, namely QAP thread. That's the thread of the GUI thread, the GUI event, the, the GUI thread, yeah. And I will go and ask that one to go to sleep 
for a second. So now I'm on the, the GUI thread and I'm sleeping there for one thread. One second. Oh, gee. Then I wake up again. I say, good morning. And again, I'll count here. So it'll only run for five iterations. And let's see what's going on when I run it here. First, I need to compile it because I changed the 100 millisecond to one second. So it goes off here three times. So every, every, uh, every 300 milliseconds goes off, then another 300 milliseconds, then the two seconds has hit and we go to sleep. And we sleep nice and quiet for a whole second. Nothing goes on in that second. Then we wake up again and says, good morning. And the timer that was supposed to time off, give and take uh, at uh, hmm, uh, 400 millisecond into uh, 1220 here, uh, it actually doesn't fire off before uh, 200 millisecond into 1221. So while it was sleeping, it wasn't like stacking up those. It wasn't hit, it, first of all, it wasn't emitting those those uh, signals that it should time out while it was sleeping, simply because it was sitting there on the event loop. In the event cube, there was a packet saying, hey, can you go off at 1220, um, 12, whatever, 1220, 300 or 400 here. But no, the event loop was busy sleeping in that slot from the other timer. And while I was sleeping, the event queue was, of course, not processed. So when it woke up again, it looked at that package in the event queue and said, oh, you're overdue. Let's fire the timer right away. And then it's scheduled the next one. And you can see the next one is scheduled down here, not trying to catch up with all those timers that was missed, but simply schedule the next one. I, of course, knew about the event loop and that no timers would fire when I was out in a long running slot, as is, as would the paint event not be executed, as would sockets not be executed, or, or events from sockets. But I was still a bit puzzled about that course timer. So I decided I would debug it and see what it looked like inside of Qt. But before I did that, I went to this episode and read up on how do I compile Qt myself, because my Qt was somewhat old compiled. So I compiled it fresh, new Qt, and I started my debugging session. So I put a breakpoint in here in that slot, could have been in that one up there. And I started the debugger, did all that beforehand because it takes a bit to start the debugger. About the time that it tells me that it takes, tells me to tell you that it takes a bit. Oh wait. Anyway, I'm now at that breakpoint. And the interesting part is when we go up the stack. So I have this key binding that I showed you in a previous episode for else down for going up my stack. You can see if you look down here, the I now at this stuff here, which is inside of Qt, that's a signal being fired there. Let's go up quite a bit up. Qt timer timeout. So that's the timer timing out. Okay, cool. That came in through a timer event. So we can actually see there's a timer event which is indeed how timers are implemented behind the scenes. They are just events being sent, just like mouse press, just like key press, just like repaint, and so on. We can go up a bit, bit further here. Now we're going into how the whole event processing is going on. And uh, up here is where things get interesting. Here you can see this is QTimer info underscore Unix. So I just gave away that I'm on a Linux system, just in case you didn't know that. And uh, if you're doing this at home on a Windows or on a Mac, it will look different very likely because this is specific for those systems. So in here you can see it's sending an event to this object with the timer, timer event here. That's how it all started. But how did it get here? Well, if we scroll up a bit, we'll see that it's executing, ooh, it's a long function, QTimer info list. So that's a queue list of QTimer info. That's the list of timers to, to fire. We go through this uh, list here, uh, or activate timers. That's what the underlying event loops mechanism is calling upon us to execute the timer. We check something out here. Are we on the right thread and whatnot? Uh, and we run through the list here and figure out how many timers to to fire. And once we fire those, and I guess we do that to avoid 
that we are in the middle of processing and then something else is timing out and then we process that and something else is timing out and we continue processing and never get back to the event loop. But that's just me speculating. Now here we start executing. So we run through the list of or the amount of, of uh, uh, um, timers that needs to fire. We fetch the first one here. We just check once again whether the current time is less than better be otherwise how would we get it go in here in the first place and I get that one blah 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 and I remove that one here's some debugging code now I calculate when should the next one go off and let's just uh, do one step further with the debugger so we can go down here so now I just ran it again and continue it on to the next firing and I'm in here let's debug into this one because this one is uh, actually pretty interesting so here I have a timer uh, timer info and a time that it should go off. So I check what is the timer type? Oh, it's a course timer. Okay. So the interval with well, the timeout is now set to plus that interval. Um, and uh, if that is less than the current time, that meant that it should have gone off after a few hundred milliseconds. Just hang on a second here. That actually answer a question I've had for the longest time. What happens if I have a timer that's supposed to go off every 100 milliseconds and then it is a slightly delayed in one of those. So it only goes off after 110 milliseconds. Will it then go off after another 100 milliseconds or will it go off after 90 milliseconds? And actually we have the answer here. It will take the original one. So we're supposed to go off at timestamp uh, zero and now I add 100 to that and even if it actually had moved a bit into that, it will have that as the next timeout. Okay, that's cool. So we check whether it's actually in the past already. And if that is the case, then we'll create a new time, timeout here and add the current interval. And given that I've been talking more than 100 milliseconds, we are definitely in the past now. So we are setting up a new timer here. And if it's a course timer, that's when we'll go down here and we will update the timer. And here's actually some interesting stuff. The comment up here tells you exactly how we are going to adjust that course timer, the plus minus 5%. And it, you can see it tries to, to wake up on specific uh, intervals. Just uh, go and look up this, uh, this function here in case that you want to read it all, or you can pause me while you read it all. In the meantime, let's just uh, continue out here. We are done updating, calculating the next timeout. And now I will insert that next timeout into my list. And the way that, if we can do debug in here, the way that it does that is that it actually goes to the end of the list and then it starts going backwards in the list. That looks like forward to you. Backwards in the list onto it comes to the time where something is before. So basically what's maintaining is a list where at the front is the timer that needs to go off the soonest. Okay, we insert into the list and we are doing some stuff there. And now we get down to, okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, sent the event. And now the timer event virtual method on queue object will be executed. And that, if it's a queue timer, is over is, is implemented to make the timer emit the signal. Yes, I admit I am a true wizard. I'm a magician. I can talk for 20 minutes about something as trivial as a queue timer. But you're welcome. I actually think at least I answered a few questions of my own. Questions that I Yes, I knew from experience, but I never been down into the source code and saw them. I'd like to thank you for watching yet another episode of Cute Widgets and more.